Members noting the time. Are there any questions today? Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable uh, Steve Thomas. Uh, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer of last week. Uh, I refer to the 2019 to 2020-21 mini boom of iron ore royalties and to articles in last week's Austra West Australian newspaper suggesting that, quote, expectations are rising that benchmark prices can get to two US $200 a tonne as Chinese steel makers ramp up and, quote, sky-high commodity prices are fueling confidence in business investment. I ask, one, what modelling has the Treasury done on high iron ore prices remaining for, A, the rest of 2021 and B, the entire 2021-2022 financial year. Two, please provide that modelling. Three, what is the Treasury's predicted spot price for iron ore for A, the rest of 2021 and B, the entire 2021-22 financial year? And four, is an iron ore spot price above US $130 a tonne for the rest of 2021 highly unrealistic? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question, uh, noting, of course, that this uh, answer is current as of the 6th of May. Uh, 1A to B, the Department of Treasury made a budgeting assumption in the 2020-21 pre-election financial projection statement, PFPS, that the iron ore price would revert to its long-run average by August 2021. 2C1, 2, 3A, iron ore price forecasts are based on whole financial years. 3B, US $65.6 per tonne, as per the 2020-2021 PFPS. 4. The iron ore price is highly volatile, and there exists a large range of plausible price paths over the remainder of the year. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam President. Ten billion bucks. I refer to the state government's $117 million. Oh, sorry, to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Finance. Better do that first. I refer to the state government's $117 million building bonus scheme announced on the 7th of June 2020 for the provision of a $20,000 grant to new home buyers with an estimated processing period of eight weeks. And I ask one, what calendar, what calendar month grant applications is the Department of Finance currently processing? Two, if the applicant must have had financial approval, signed a contract and started construction to the point of having earthworks or demolition commenced, is this scheme more of a cash back scheme than a stimulus scheme? Three, if not, why not? Four, if noted to, how can the applicant incorporate the grant into the decision to proceed if they have already signed a contract to, contract to proceed? And five, is the grant therefore unable to be considered by a financial institution when considering a funding application? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notes of the question. One, the Department of Finance are currently assessing applications submitted before 17 December 2020. Two, the building bonus is an important stimulus measure introduced as part of the WA recovery plan and was designed to create a strong pipeline of work and create certainty for the building industry as WA recovered from the economic impact of COVID-19. To apply for the building bonus grant, an applicant needed to sign a new contract with a registered builder between 4 June and 31 December 2020, with construction needing to commence within 12 months of the contract date. Owner builders were required to complete laying the foundations of the new home on the land by 31 December 2020. The strong performance of the housing construction industry, as evidenced by our state's low, record low unemployment rate and strong building approvals data, is proof that this stimulus program has been incredibly successful in supporting the sector through the, through the uncertainty of the pandemic, as was intended when the policy was introduced. Three, see answer to two. Four, the building bonus is not guaranteed to every applicant and will only be paid if the applicant meets the eligibility requirements. Five, the grant is unable to be taken into account by a financial institution when considering a funding application for the reasons described in the answer to question four, which aligns with the Federal Government Home Builder Programme. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Small Business. I refer to the impact of lockdowns on the small business sector, and I ask one, is the small business sector consulted ahead of any proposed lockdowns, and if yes, how? Two, has ongoing consultation with the sector occurred during the pandemic emergency period? If yes, when? Three, is the impact on businesses considered when a decision to issue a lockdown is made? Four, what is the total compensation paid to date across all small business assistance package, packages since COVID-19 pandemic began? And five, how many individual businesses have received compensation and how many have been rejected? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question, and I provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Small Business. One, West Australian Police conducts a weekly industry liaison group meeting with business stakeholders to discuss how previous lockdowns have been implemented and identify how businesses can prepare for any future lockdown. The Small Business Commissioner participates in those meetings. Two, C1. Uh, three, the impact on the entire West Australian community, including the business community, is considered when making the difficult decision to direct a lockdown. Four, across a wide 
range of assistant packages, a total of $1.2 in relief initiatives have been provided to businesses. Five, there is no aggregated data available to answer this question. It is expected that the Small Business Lockdown Assistant Grant Scheme will be provided to 15,000 businesses. Honourable Peter Collier. <coughs> Some is given is the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to the proposed changes to the Our Commitment document of Lottery West to update equality, diversity and inclusion, which have been delayed due to the controversy surrounding the rejection of the Margaret Court Community Outreach application, and which were requested by myself under supplementary information E1 during the Budget Estimates hearing of Thursday, the 19th of November 2020. And I ask one, will you provide a copy of the proposed changes as requested on the 19th of November 2020? And two, if not, why not? The Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, yes. It was proposed that the Our Commitment Statement in the Lottery West Strategic Plan be amended as follows. Present Our Commitment Statement. We are a government enterprise that aims to be the preferred provider of lottery games, optimise delivery and maximise returns and value to West Australians. Two, not applicable. The Honourable Donna Farragher. That's not all. Without notice, of which some notice has been given, is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the Minister's joint press statement dated the 14th of December 2020, titled McGowan Government Delivers Funding Boost for Community Services. And I ask, will the Minister list the community service providers who receive funding as part of this announcement and a breakdown of the funding allocated to each? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Member, for some notice of the question. As per the media announcement on the 14th of December, it says here 2021, but it's meant to say 20, the McGowan government will provide a $15 million funding boost to support eligible community service providers. A total of $9 million of the announced funding was allocated to the Department of Communities for disbursement across eligible contracts, including family and domestic violence, homelessness, mental health and out-of-home care services. A breakdown on the disbursement of the funding will be provided before the end of the current financial year once recipient organisations have been informed. The remaining $6 million was allocated to the Mental Health Commissioner for disbursement across eligible contracts. The Honourable Nick Moran. Madam President, uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Pr Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney-General. I refer to concerns raised with you by the Law Society of WA about the availability of courtrooms for criminal trials, and I ask, one, are you aware that the Law Society have said that this is making the operation of the criminal justice system in this state almost unworkable? Two, are you aware that the Law Society have asked you to urgently commit to an additional four, but preferably seven, new courts for criminal trials in Perth? Three, did you convene a roundtable discussion in response to these concerns, as you said you would in a recent radio interview? Four, when did this roundtable discussion take place and who attended? Five, will you table the minutes, notes or other documents created by you or your staff at this roundtable discussion? And six, what action will now arise as a result of this roundtable discussion? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for First, sorry, to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. Answer A to F. The Attorney General is aware of the Law Society's position. A roundtable discussion with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Chief Judge of the District Court, and representatives from the Department of Just Justice and the Department of Finance is scheduled for the 18th of May 2021. The Honourable Alison without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Planning. Uh, I refer to the outstanding and urgent need for a third party right of appeal process and I ask one, will the Minister commit to developing a third party right of appeal process regarding development applications? Two, will the Minister commit to developing a third party right of appeal process regarding local planning scheme amendments? Three, will the Minister com commit to developing a third party right of appeal process regarding metropolitan region scheme amendments? Four, if no, twenty question, why not? And five, if yes, twenty question. In. Leader of the House. Thanks, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to five. No, this matter was detailed and addressed in the Legislative Council's consideration of the Planning and Development Amendment Bill 2020. Honourable Colin Tinknell. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice of which some notice is given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police uh, regarding the removal of dog, uh, police dog from Broome. Over the weekend, it was reported on uh, the media by Broome residents that those in the Greater Kimberley region will be losing their only police dog, Hank, when he has and his handler, Ben, are relocated to Perth this week. One, can the minister confirm 
if it's true that Hank and Ben have been recalled from Broome, and if so, can the Minister please offer an explanation, given Hank's valuable, successful service in the Kimberley, as to why this is being done? And D, B, does the government have any plans to reinstate Hank in Broome or replace him with another valuable police dog? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. One, no, it's not true. The WA Police Force advise Hank will remain posted to the Kimberley. The Honourable Colin Holt. Thanks, Madam President, my question, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the State Government's management of hotel quarantine, and I ask one, regarding the McCure Hotel, the Four Points Hotel, and the Novotel Langley. On what date will each hotel be, to be decommissioned for the use by returning travellers? Two, on what date will each hotel receive their final intake of guests? Three, regarding yesterday's mandatory vaccination deadline for hotel security guards, how many guards did not begin the vaccination process prior to May 10? And four, can you confirm that those guards are no longer employed in hotel quarantine security roles due to not receiving the COVID vaccination? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, McCure Hotel, the last guest departed 10 May 2021. Four Points Hotel, the last guest is scheduled to depart 16 May 2021. Uh, Novotel Langley, the last guest is scheduled to depart 11 May 2021. Two, no further guests will be allocated to the McCure Hotel or the Four Points Hotel. The, no the, the Novotel Langley Hotel will no longer be a quarantine hotel and will only receive seasonal workers going forward. Three, unknown. Four, yes. Honourable Question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. I refer to your answer of 4 May 2021 concerning the DON 100 wine up prescribed burn conducted by the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions (DBCA) and the burn's impact on one of two endangered numbat habitats. And I ask one. How many numbat dens were identified by the DBCA and adjacent property owners prior to the prescribed burn and how many dens remain? Two, how many numbats were, quote, observed before, during and after the prescribed burn, end quote, and in what condition were these animals at each of the three occasions of observation took place? And three, when were the above observations undertaken and how were these observations recorded? Leader of the House. Oh, no, sorry, Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President. Jump early. No worries, it's definitely me. One, seven marked numbat dens were identified prior to the burn, and five of these have been observed since the burn. Two to three, the following numbers of numbats were observed incidentally in the DON 100 Wiener prescribed burn area. 15 numbats between 3 September 2019 and when the final cell burn commenced on 25 March 2021. Three numbats were observed, observed during the burn on 25 March 2021. Two numbats were observed after the burn on 26 March and 1 May 2021. All numbats were reported as active. Uh, the observations were made in the field by both the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attraction staff and members of the public, and were recorded on a report form and transferred into the department's fauna file recording system. The Honourable Robin Chappell. Without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I refer to the consultation process for the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill 2020, and I do apologise, it's most probably doesn't, didn't need the 2020. I ask who has the minister met with so far? Uh, who is the minister planning to meet with? Three, when will these meetings take place and by what means, i.e. visiting local communities, inviting community leaders to Perth or via video conference? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for the answer to the question. One, the previous Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and I have met with a number of stakeholders where the agenda included the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill. I ask that this part of the question be put on notice. Two, I or my staff are meeting with representatives of organisations who want to bring their views on the bill to my attention. Three, these meetings have been or are being held in Perth, on country and via video conference where appropriate. The Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Sport and Recreation. I refer to the McGowan Government's pre-election promise to spend $5 million on upgrading the Niels Hansen Basketball Stadium in Kalgoorlie. I ask, one, does the Government intend on honouring its promise? Two, if not, why not? And three, if yes, how long can the people of Kalgoorlie expect to wait until the upgrade works are underway? Leader of the House. 
Thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One yes. Two not applicable. Three, the City of Kalgoorlie Boulder and the Kalgoorlie Boulder Basketball Association are developing a project timeline identifying key project milestones. This information will be made available to the public in due course. The Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, my question, without notice of which some has been given, is directed to the Leader of the House. And I refer to your answer to my question without notice number 43 of the 5th of May 2021 regarding discussions with the Premier about the change of presidency of the House on 22nd May and ask, one, have you had any discussions with the Premier regarding the appointment on 22nd May of a new president of the Legislative Council, yes or no? Two, was the termination of legal proceedings being taken by and against the Legislative Council discussed and what was the substance and outcome of those discussions? And three, was the prospective new president a part of those discussions or informed of them and what action was agreed to be taken. Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I'm not sure this fits within standing orders, but in any event, one to three, the Premier does not appoint Labor nominees for parliamentary positions. The process of electing Labor Party parliamentary positions is done through the State Parliamentary Labor Caucus. Nominations are called for and, if necessary, a ballot is held. Every member of the State Parliamentary Labor Caucus is entitled to discuss the positions to be filled with other members of caucus. I had numerous discussions with many members about filling those positions, and those discussions are private. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Thank you, My question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Electoral Affairs. I refer to an article published by the Kalgoorlie Minor on 5 May 2021 entitled MP Kyle McGinn says he will listen to his electorate before making any decisions on electoral reform and ask one. Given the comments of the recently elevated Labor frontbencher, will Labor, will Labor MPs be able to express their vote freely and in response to their electorate's views on any proposed electoral reform? Two, if no to one, why does Mr McGinn appear to be misguided by his ability to vote in the interests of his electorate rather than his party? Three, I note that the terms of reference for the Ministerial Expert, pa Expert Committee cite the, and I quote, term of appointment, end quote, as eight weeks from Cabinet appointment. What was the date of Cabinet appointment? And four, what is the cost of the Ministerial Expert Committee to date and the expected total cost? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I thank the member for some notice of the question. One to two, just as in the National Party room, all members of the Labor caucus are entitled to freely express their views in caucus and a vote in accordance with them. Order. The member is the parliamentary secretary is providing a response to the question that was asked. Let him provide it, please. Thank you, Madam President. Three, 28 April 2021. Four, cost to dates and final costs are currently being determined. The Honourable Diane Evers. President, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the minister representing is to the minister for state De development and jobs and trade. I refer to Alcoa's recent application, EPA assessment number 2253, to directly export 2.5 million tonnes of bauxite each year, and I ask one, will the minister please advise how much Jera Forest is cleared to produce 2.5 million tonnes of bauxite, and if no, why not? Two, what is the economic cost in loss of habitat, social surroundings and biodiversity of the areas to be cleared? Three, what is the estimated revenue per annum that the state will earn from bauxite royalties associated with the 2.5 million tonnes of bauxite? Four, will the minister please table working arrangement documents mentioned in the referral regarding the management of mine operations between A, Alcoa and the Bio Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, and B, Water Corporation and the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, and if no, why not? The Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I thank the member for the question, and the following information has been provided by uh, the Minister for uh, State Development, Jobs and Trade. Uh, the Minister has said that uh, further time is required to answer this question uh, and the information will be provided to the member by the 13th of May 2021. The Honourable Steve Thomas. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier, uh, 75. Uh, I refer to the Premier's announcement of 9 May 2021 that grants of $4,000 will be made available to small businesses and residents severely, severely impacted by Cyclone Saroja. And I ask one, what is the specific financial and geographical criteria for a small business and residents to access the $4,000 grant? And will the Premier table the criteria? Two, what small business will be eligible to apply for the $4,000 grant? Three, what is the government's 
applicable de definition of a small business, deeming them eligible to apply for the grant. Four, how is the figure of $4,000 grant arrived at or calculated? Five, who will be assessing the grant and what right of appeal does small business have in the decision-making process? And six, is the grant a tax-free payment for small businesses? Leader of the House. Thank the Honourable Member for some notice of a question. One, further details of the application process will be available shortly, as highlighted in the media statement released on Sunday the 9th of May. Two, as noted in the media statement, the sectors will include, for example, small retailers such as specialty shops, hairdressers and bakeries, tourism businesses including tour operators and fishing boat charters, and hospitality venues including accommodation providers, cafes, restaurants and pubs. Uh, 3C1, for the $4,000 grant aligns with the support to residents for loss or, of loss or significant damage to homes and recent assistance in response to the Wurraloo bushfires. 5C1, 6, the tax tre treatment is a Commonwealth matter. However, the grants are expected to be tax-free in accordance with other disaster relief payments to individuals and businesses. The Honourable Nick Garan. Question without notice of which some notice has been given is the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to Nigel Pindan, an offender with a serious criminal history and the concerns about his placement upon release in the same complex of units as female victims of sexual assault. And I ask, one, are you aware that the State Solicitor's Office argued against the offender's release on the basis that the proposed accommodation was not suitable? Two, did you take advice on an appeal of the decision of Justice Hill? Three, if yes to two, from whom? Four, if no to two, why not? And five, what action do you intend to take as a result of this decision? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following answer on behalf of the Attorney General. Answer uh, one, yes, two, no, three, not applicable, four, the AG or the Attorney General did not receive advice that there was anything appealable in the decision of Justice Hill. Five, see answer to four. The Honourable Robin Scott. President, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to the McGowan government's pre-election promise to spend $100,000 on renovating the Barnes Federal Theatre in Leonora. I ask, one, does the government intend on honouring its promise? Two, if not, why not? Three, if yes, how long can the people of Leonora expect to wait until renovation works are underway? And four, will the government commit to spending the extra funds required to bring the Barnes Federal Theatre back to an operational standard? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, look, I, I thank uh, the member for the question. I do find his line of questioning really quite um, um, uh, surprising. I think it's uh, fair to say that we have been in government less than two months. Less than two months. And of course, member, uh, we have every intention of, uh, of honouring uh, all of our election uh, commitments. I mean, obviously, we don't just have piles of cash lying around, put them up in envelopes and post them out. There is actually a, a, a budget. Um, there is a budget and governance framework, and uh, but we have made it uh, very clear um, that those small elections, such as uh, this one, um, have got um, have got priority, and they are being worked on. Uh, the Goldfields Esperance Development Commission is ready to enter into a formal funding agreement with the. Uh, a shire of Leonora, which I expect will be forthcoming in uh, in weeks. Um, uh, now, the commitment that we made uh, for one hundred thousand dollars was a part of a, a larger project. It was a contribution uh, to the project, and the shire advised us of the time uh, that they thought this was going to be what they needed from us. It would enable them uh, to leverage uh, further grants. Um, once they had this money, so we uh, uh, we understand the shire is um, is working on that leverage and are completing the uh, uh, the plans for the renovation as we speak. The Honourable Alison Simon. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney-General. Uh, will the Attorney-General commit to introducing legislation to repeal and eliminate all remaining mandatory sentencing provisions? Two, if yes, when and which specific provisions? And three, if no, to one, why not? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney-General. 
and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide this answer on behalf of the Attorney General. One to three, the Attorney General has a full suite of reforms which will be delivered this term of Parliament as part of the McGowan government's agenda to keep WA strong. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Electoral Affairs. I refer to Legislative Council question without notice 24 and 58 regarding the Ministerial Expert Committee on Electoral Reform and ask one, how many of the committee members currently reside in regional Western Australia? Two, are any of the committee members previously or currently members of the Labor Party or staff to Labor members of Parliament? Three, on what date or dates did the Minister consult with the Electoral Commissioner in relation to the establishment of the Expert Committee? And four, why is the Electoral Commissioner not considered an expert? on electoral affairs and represented on the committee. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One, none. Two, the committee member, uh, no committee member is currently a member of the Labor Party. I table their CVs. Those documents are tabled. Three, the Minister has spoken to or met with the Electoral Commissioner on more than one occasion since being appointed Minister for Electoral Affairs. The last meeting was on 1 April 2021 and electoral reform was discussed at that time. The Commissioner was notified in writing of the Cabinet decision to establish the Expert Committee on 30 April 2021. And four, the Electoral Commissioner is an expert and will be consulted in relation to the Committee's recommendations to Government. The Honourable Yuan Sibber. Knew that deep, deep vein. My question, without notice of which some notice is provided, is to the parliamentary secretary representing the Minister for Electoral Affairs. And I refer to the government's expedient decision to prioritise electoral reform of the Legislative Council, despite the Premier ruling this out repeatedly during the election. And I ask one, was it the Cabinet's decision to break an election promise and overturn the Honourable Jim McGuinty's legislation, or was this decision taken by the Premier and the Minister for Electoral Affairs alone? Two, did the Minister for Electoral Affairs devise the construction and membership of the, quote, Ministerial Expert Committee on Electoral Reform, end quote? And when was this decision taken and how was it communicated to members of the committee? And three, who drafted the committee's terms of reference? Were, for example, the members of the committee consulted in the process? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney-General, I think there's probably one part of that question in relation to a matter dealt before Cabinet that you probably won't be able to provide a response to. Thank you, Madam Pe President, and uh, I thank the member for some notice of the question, and I provide the following answers on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One, no election promise has been broken. Two, I refer the member to Legislative Council question without notice number 24, which previously answers the first limb of this question. In relation to the second limb, members were advised in writing on the 29th of April 2021. Three, members of the committee were consulted during the drafting process. Four, there there is no present intention, intention to extend the deadline. Honourable Diane Evers. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for State Development, Jobs and Trade. I refer to Alcoa's Huntley Mine in the Darling Range and I ask one. Satellite imagery reveals a growing 300 hectare mining pit which is two kilometres wide and located southeast of Carnet Prison Farm. A network of such pits extends over a range of approximately 20 kilometres and new pits contain islands of habitat that are disconnected from the remnant forest nearby. Will the minister please advise, A, is there a maximum limit to the size of these pits? B, if there is a maximum to the percentage of cleared forest in a mining envelope for an approved mine, C, what measures are taken to protect animal and plant species in those stranded habitats? D, whether fauna and flora management plans for these areas are available to the public? E, if species survey data before and after mining exist, and if so, will they be made available? Two, if no to any of the above, one A to E, why not? Minister for Regional Development. Um, I thank the member for the question, and uh, the Minister for State Development has provided the following information, um, and that is that more time is required to answer this question. The information will be provided to the member by 13 May 2021. Martin My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. I refer to Legislative Council question without notice 1046 in relation to containers for change and a number of refund locations not yet established requiring my constituents to travel long distances in order to receive a deposit refund and I ask one, what is the status of establishing refund points in Jinjin, Kojinup and Morrowa? Two, I refer to the interim services mentioned in the then Minister's response to part two and three of the aforementioned question in October 2020 and ask if these interim services 
have now been established? Three, does the Minister believe it to be acceptable for residents in Morawa to be forced to travel 232 kilometres to Port Denison return to get their 10 cents refunded? And four, as Minister for Environment and now Climate Action, what assessment has been done on the carbon footprint associated with the Containers for Change scheme and specifically the transportation of containers? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, one to three. Uh, the network in place at scheme, scheme commencement on 1 October 2020 exceeded the requirements set out in the minimum network standards. The network is required to be at 100 per cent of these standards by 1 October 2021. Since the then Minister for Environment responded to the Honourable Member's question in October last year, I'm pleased to advise that a very successful refund point has been established in Northampton, run by the local men's shed, and the All Good ref, uh, Refund Depot has opened at Lake Grace. Lancelin-based Eco Exchange is working with the Shire of Gingin to establish a mobile service. This mobile service is expected to commence in early June 2021. Motown Community Shed has been appointed to operate a, a depot refund point at Morrowa. The Morrowa refund point was scheduled to start on 6 May. However, Cyclone Saroja caused damage to the shed and took out power to the town. With repairs being completed, it is estimated operations will commence late June 2021. Catanning Environmental, the Catanning refund point operator, is working with local businesses and the Shire to establish a refund point in Cogenup. A bag drop is expected to commence on 30 May. Uh, four, the environmental impacts of transport was a significant consideration in designing the logistics network for transporting containers, both in regional areas and in the Perth and Peel and Wheatbelt regions. The regional transport network takes advantage of backloading to minimise unnecessary truck movements. Ramondas was chosen to operate the collection and processing of non-gas pro products for our container deposit scheme for the Perth, Peel and Wheatbelt regions. In a first for schemes in Australia, Ramondas uses on-site and rear lift truck compaction to reduce the amount of air and increase the number of bottles able to be collected and transported. This model has significant benefits in terms of reducing its carbon footprint, increasing efficiency, lowering costs and providing a safer work environment through reduced vehicle movements. Ramondas was recognised and highly commended at the recent Waste Sorted Awards for its innovative approach. A leader of the House. Be resumed. Business of the House is resumed. Are there any further point of order, the Honourable Michael Mission? Uh, an answer to a question last week. Uh, it was directed to you th uh, through the attorney. Sorry, not to you, but to uh, the Honourable um, Matthew Swinburne. It was to the Attorney General, and there was no time to, uh, to investigate and provide the answer at that time. I was oh, promised an right. answer today. Perhaps um, we may very well get to that with further answers, um, or uh, you might I, provide the answer at that uh, point. No, no, I don't have an answer, but I can say that the commitment was given to give the answer this week, not today. So okay. it will be provided to you this week. Okay. Right. All right. Are there any further answers from any minister? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President. Uh, I would like to provide answers to the Honourable Donna Farragher's question without notice 56 and question without notice 67, which were asked last week, and I seek leave to have them incorporated into Hansard. The Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information to Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Are there any further answers from any minister or parliamentary secretary? The Honourable Donna Farragher on a point of order. Yes. Just, and I, I'm, I did, there was two questions that were, were put. I'm just wanting to just double check that both were actually tabled. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam President. I uh, appreciate the point of order. Uh, both questions uh, were mentioned in my statement. Oh, okay. And that, they were questions uh, question without notice 56 and question without notice 67. You, and I, see, I sought I leave to have the them part. both incorporated to Hansard. And I, I think that's what Madam President. That's exactly think. right. They, they were so. Are there any further answers from any minister or parliamentary secretary? If not, members, we return to orders of the day.